Today I'm going to meet Patrick, a resourceful British expat who traded in his career in computer programming for a life of invention and self-reliance in a small Italian village called Monte Compedri. Let's go meet this inventive maverick who is gradually untethering himself from the confines of the matrix and is redefining what it means to live life on his own terms. Hi Patrick, <laughs> thanks Hi, for Michelle. agreeing to let me into your house. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you're, um, you're not far from me and I met you through Romeo, our mutual friend. I've seen you a couple of times but I don't know anything about you and so I wanted to ask you how you ended up in Italy <clears throat> and what made you choose Monte Compadre of all places? Well originally I came here because I was offered a job with the European Space Agency who have a centre near Frascati. And this was uh, 30 years ago, about. So I came out, worked in IT for th three years, and it was great. I loved it here. Perhaps it's because my first serious job, and I had my own place to live in, and I had the nice weather, and I could go to the beach. And then I had a Vespa and a motorbike, and uh, just in enjoyed the lifestyle so much, as well as it being yeah, good weather and healthy and eating well. I originally lived in Rocca di Papa, which is one of the hills behind me, in fact, behind the hill behind me. And it's almost a different climate up there, it's a bit fresher, but I had lots of woodland around me and uh, nice views. So I lived there for a few years, but I felt it was a bit remote, cut off. And I remember coming through Monte Compatri, this town here, thinking it was much closer to Rome, it's also surrounded by national park and woodland. So I first rented an apartment, which is the one on the other side of the piazza. You can actually see it where the bar sign is. I rented that apartment, which is 30 square meters for a few years and uh, renovated it. This is when I came back to Italy because the job at the European Space Agency lasted about three or four years. And then I went back to the UK and did some contracting work in IT. But I missed Italy and I wanted the chance to come back. And I came back and did a few little jobs, not quite the same job. But and that's when I rented that place. And I had the idea of basically, basically making it my home because in, the, in those days it seemed much cheaper to live, more simple, it was a lot cheaper. So it became like my base, my home. And while I was in that apartment, which is, doesn't have a lot of sun or a garden or a balcony or anything, I was, you know, looking for something that did. Actually, the story goes is I was on the piazza one day and uh, feeling this breeze coming up the piazza. And it reminded me of when I um, used to fly hang gliders in England. I was also chairman of the hang gliding society at my university. And I hadn't been flying for a long time, and I had this really strong nostalgia for flying. And normally you have to have a hill to take off, or a good fit, a good wind. And I just happened to think, well, you could actually take off from here, because you've got a good drop in front of the Let's have a look front. at that, okay, because otherwise and it's I was, hard and to imagine. I was admiring this building, because you could basically do a cliff launch from the rooftop. The idea excited me a lot. And I was thinking it'd be fantastic to have this building and then and and do such a thing. And then I dropped the idea and forgot about it, thinking, well, what's the chances that you could buy this one property, you know, in the foreseeable future? Yeah. And as it happened, I was chatting to a state agent friend, and uh, he told me that this had gone on the market a few months ago, just about the time that I was, you know, yeah. speculating. And said, you know, put an offer in. So I, I did to put in the, you know, How long an ago offer. was that? And they took it. How long ago this was that? Uh, about 20 years ago. 20 years? A so couple more, 22 years ago. I had lots of ideas how to make it, you know, as I wanted. So I went a bit overboard in restructuring and... Renovating. Renovating, and dismantling it, putting it apart. But it was structurally sound. You didn't have any problems or with like not having proper planning permission or anything. It was a regular. Well, yeah, normal, normal. I mean, this, this building is 150 years old at least. And, um, you know, there is a bit of vibrations. It's right next to the road. 
you know, it does have the age. But there is a lot of paperwork, bureaucracy procedure for doing things officially, which is probably why a lot of Italians generally do it the alternative way, which is discreetly and <laughs> wait, that wait for them to yeah. get caught, to catch up. So I had a few contractors who helping me with the work, but I didn't have so many financial limitations as I do now. Yeah. And I think they took advantage of that fact. And uh, so I, I, and also I didn't, I expected to get, you know, good value for money. But when I saw the, the quality of work that they were doing, I was a bit disappointed. And I made a decision to, right, from now I'm going to do it myself. And you're capable and, uh, of doing everything so, yourself. Well, capable. I'd never done it before, but I, the way, seeing what they did, I thought, well, I could do this. And, yeah. So how long did your contract at the European Space Agency, was it a... Well, I didn't work for them directly. I worked for the, for one of the contractor companies as an employee. It was, you know, ongoing, but uh, you're not paid nearly as much as the staff no. are. And I worked for them for about three and a half years. Okay. So where are you from? You're English, obviously. <laughs> like Sussex. I recognise you're from Sussex. West okay. Sussex. Yes. And so you're an expert in IT, is that right? What do you do? Well, I was a programmer and uh, programmer. engineer at the time. Wow. And, uh, and you don't still do practice. that at all? Uh, not, not professionally, no. No. Yeah. I still like the idea it would do, but I don't feel so comfortable sitting in front of a computer all the time like before. Yeah. When you're young, you don't seem to no. think about these things. But now I'm much more conscious of what's good for my body and spirit, if you like. Right. So after you stopped working at the European Space Agency, you you wanted to have this as your base. So were you hoping to get another job here or did you not look for a job? Did you not worry about that? What, mm, how did you manage to move back here eventually? Uh, well, the pattern is, is that I quit the job feeling that I can afford to uh, and for a very short time, I enjoy doing whatever I, you know, entertains me. And then, then I can't afford to do it after a relatively short period of time. And then I have to get another job. And so the next major job I had was actually in Germany in the 90s. And I was working in IT for a, a training bank, a futures bank. So I was actually quite well paid for that. After working for them for three or four years, I, I saved saved uh, you know, enough money to buy this place, actually. And so that's when you moved here, after Germany. And did you get another job in Italy? How did you manage to finance your life in Italy? Is there, were you able to find any work here or not? Well, to be honest, I haven't really looked very hard. My impression was that the, the, the job market isn't quite as fluid and uh, remunerative as the northern countries of Europe. So I didn't think it would be worth my while, you know, even looking. I, besides, I was quite happily entertained with my own projects. And one of my projects was with the original intention of making money. And it was, you know, in the process of my renovations, I had some ideas of how to do things in a better way. And I, one was to recycle the heat from the shower water, the waste shower water. And I expected to find some kind of heat exchanger commercially in order to do this. Because what I noticed while I was having showers in my garage during renovation, it was taking an awfully long time to heat up the water. And in four years, in seven minutes, it would be all gone. Uh, it seemed a big waste of water, of, of heating. So, but then I couldn't find these, these, these things. So you okay. couldn't find it, what you were looking for? No, I couldn't find this thing. So I thought, well it needs to exist it should exist and i did some research and long story short is i ended up making my own patent application for such a thing and i did that for a couple of years sort of refined it made it better and and was pretty convinced that it was worth worth uh, patenting worth producing making and i basically you know applied for patents internationally in many many territories america Britain, Europe, and you have to do that at the beginning. You have to, you know, yeah. you can't do it later. So I focus on that, and also the technical aspects of what it would take to to materialize. So I extended myself 
financially on that aspect. But then to actually do the, the work of producing it, of developing it, prototype, and manufacturing it, it also requires substantial financial resources, which were beyond my own. And I didn't manage to to get finance to, to do, do that. So, so you're basically an, an inventor. You invented yeah, this thing. Yeah. And would it have worked if you'd managed to For sure. produce it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But you still have the patent. I, well, I have, I did, but I can't afford to keep it anymore. So, no. I mean, the patents for, for big corporations that have got a lot of resources and, and are active commercially. Okay. And that's not me. I'm just doing my own thing in, at home. So, so your, your patent recuperates hot water that otherwise would just go down the drain. Well, so yeah, well, the water does go down the drain, but before it goes down the drain, it goes through a heat exchanger in the shower, yeah. shower tray. And that way I can heat up the cold water to a you know, moderate temperature. So I reduce the heating requirement for having a hot shower substantially. I didn't realize you were an inventor. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, all the, a lot of the clutter in my house actually is, you know, my attempt to make a prototype. So to make a good prototype, it needs to be done precisely. So you need actually precision machines, electronic mm -hmm. like CNC, they're called computer controlled, numeric controlled um, machines. And because it's quite a big, uh, big object, it needs to be quite a big machine. And, and these industrial machines are not, you know, very expensive, even to, to, to rent or to get people to do these things yeah. for me would be very expensive. So I thought, well, I'll make my own. Right. And, um, so you made your own machine? Yeah, my own CNC machine. It's weighs a ton sitting in the sitting room. Yeah, so you're a bit of a, uh, almost a wasted genius, I suppose. Well, not, not wasted genius, this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people that have similar passions for doing, yeah. doing their own thing. So, I could afford to indulge my Yeah. Have my you ever hobbies. thought of having like a GoFundMe to fund it? I mean, if it's a good invention. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've thought about that. But, you know, it's another thing that also takes serious attention and, and yeah. time investment to, you know, that's the problem with the project itself. To just do the funding and finding the funding is, is a yeah. job in itself. Yeah. And um, for me, when you consider all the different things that need to be done, you really need a team. Yeah. And I um, couldn't do it on my own, yeah. No, you can't do it on your own. So what's your typical day like? How, is it uh, putting around with your inventions? I don't know, it seems to be quite a romantic sort of thing, just uh, dedicating all your time to your inventions. Or well, I think things have changed a bit then. I think it's changed when, when the, you know, the money ran out, basically. Yeah. So, you know, I, there was a period where you could say I was depressed when I, when the reality was starting to sink in the fact that I wasn't going to be able to continue doing it because uh, without any financial resources. Yeah. And I, at the same time, was also renovating my my home, and that in itself is also a substantial job to do. Yeah, especially if you do years. it a bit at a time. I mean, if you've got the money to do it all together, yeah. you end up also saving money, don't you? Yeah. Because if you're just trying to do a little bit at a time, yeah. then you seem to end up spending a lot more yeah. for some reason. Everything takes time. Well, I was quite young at the time and just jumped, you know, through energy at stuff. And But it was bad timing because the invention and the patents coincided with my renovation. And I was living in a house where I'd knocked all the, the plaster off the walls. So I was living in like a cement cage without the cement and um and without windows as well because i'd ripped them out and was building new ones and very dusty um so it's a sort of situation you can tolerate for a few months but when it goes on year after year eventually it kind of has an effect and then also i realized you need to to keep strong you also need to be well nourished and have a balanced lifestyle and, and yeah. i think i hadn't appreciated the importance of, you know, I take it for granted the fact that uh, other people would do the cooking when you're living on your own and you have to feed yourself. You have to stop doing something just so you can have yeah. a decent meal. Yeah. yeah. So my things have changed. So since then, I now I, it's more important to me to live in a way that's sustainable and 
satisfying, which means that the baseline is that, you know, I look after myself. If you were having problems, was there something stopping you going back to England and maybe asking family for help? Know. Well, I, I did. I used to go back to England occasionally for Christmas and say hello to my, you know, sisters. And but those days, I also had a car. I could drive back. I used to drive back, and because it was a British car. Uh, the last few years, it's changed because, apart from the fact that even having a car is uh, became an expense, and in Italy, whilst I paid it like a couple of hundred quid for my British car insurance in Italy they wouldn't recognize the the no claims bonus so it would have cost me a good years 1300 euros to insure it yeah 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 and uh, to convert the number plate on my on my BMW would have cost me 4000 euros to begin with yeah just uh, plus a lot of expense it's ridiculously expensive a lot of things and then brexit yeah. as well yeah so my car ended up staying in England and then my brother-in-law sold it for scrap and that was my, the end of my last car uh, so since then I get around on a electric scooter basically oh, I saw you on Via Fontana Candida the other day and that's actually why you came to mind I thought oh that guy looks like Patrick <laughs> it was you I thought it was you oh, was. oh well, goodness for these little scooters so they want to change the legislation on those now don't they, yeah, they it's inevitable it number but I mean and crash hats and stuff yeah well I'm the only re I mean, they're, they're supposed to be ecological, which I have my doubts about, but at least I don't have the burden of insurance and of all insurance. that nonsense. And so how did you handle Brexit? I hadn't been that interested or in following the politics of Brexit and what's going on in the UK. But that's another thing that's also changed a lot in the last few years. Um, I think it was the beginning of the, the pandemic, not only put a hamper on my trips back to England, but I realised in the pandemic that the how do I say the interference of the state in our lives was getting out of hand and this was a time for me to start waking up and sort of not ignoring it anymore right. and so I, I, I've basically been a lot more focused on on what's happening in society these days it's just been interesting because it's taken me down various rabbit holes and and I'm I think relatively a lot more awake than I was before to what's going on. Comparing life in Italy to life in Britain, do you think it's cheaper to live here? Is that one of the reasons you, you chose to stay here? Because you actually need less money every month, or do you find it just the same? When I originally came out here, I certainly believed it was a lot cheaper to live here and more simple for living. Since I haven't been living in UK for the last few decades I, I don't really know what to compare it with but I even though prices have gone up a lot since then I imagine that it's somewhat cheaper I don't know how much perhaps not so much but there, there's some things which are cheaper and some things are more expensive so for example public transport is cheaper in, in Italy insurance and other you know required costs are a lot more expensive and food Probably simple foods are quite, uh, probably, probably a bit cheaper here. I'm not sure how much, but then you don't have the same choice or range of things. If you want exotic things, it's perhaps cheaper in the UK. Okay. How much do you think you need a month here just to live? You know, without any extra stuff like going out or you know the Perry TV or dinners out and. How much do you think is the bare minimum that a person needs mm. to live? Well, how long is a piece of string? So it depends yeah, exactly. on many, many things, I really. It depends whether you want to be autonomous and have your own place to live in, if you have to rent a place and pay the bills. Uh, there are a lot of travelers that just stay as guests and, or, for example, work away for travelers who want to do voluntary work and have a place to live and stay in. You can reduce the cost in various ways. Personally, my, my own experience is that I don't, having my own place to live and not having to pay rent, it seems, you know, 500 quid a month is hard 500? Yeah. It's not a lot, is it? Are not you sure? Lot. Gosh, I don't know if I'd be able to live There's a minimum, that. bare minimum. Yeah, I mean, I, I am very frugal. I mean, obviously, it's a long time since I bought new clothes and 
new, you know, yeah. maintenance things for the house, like sheets and like 30 years old and yeah. But that's just bare existence. How often do you go into Rome? Do you go down into Rome very often? You can um, find everything you need in the village or not. I do go to Rome. For example, there's a big market, the Esquilino, you know, yeah, near the yeah. central station. So they have more tropical products as well. So, and there's a bit cheaper there. Generally, I don't need to go much. What are your projects for the future? Are they going to be in Italy? Are you going to stay in Italy? Uh, I don't know. I can speak for, for the moment. At the moment, I'm more interested in sustainable living and living more off-grid or autonomously. So I have this piece of land in front of the house, yeah. uh, which I've just planted uh, about 25 fruit trees on it and look forward to harvesting some fruit from it. But we shall see. It's a fairly steep west-facing slope, so and there's big trees next to me from the commune, so I don't have that much sun. And it'll, also, it's a lot of work to to terrace the, the slope. Yeah, but um, it's the only land I've got, so let's uh, make the most of it. There's so, a big tree there. You've got yep. figs already. Yeah, I get a couple of figs. That's, I planted that about 10, over 10 years ago. And there's a few other fruit trees that didn't do so well over these years because most of the trees are... Um, they call it um, like a paper mulberry tree that grows rampantly and uh, blocks out everything else, which I've just chopped them down and helps to heat the heat the house. So you use the wood you chop down to heat your house. I do, so yes. How cold is it in Monte Compadre in the winter? Is it very hard to heat? It's not cold? so cold, but then uh, it's also, I've also been getting more and more used to the cold. In fact, I think it's a positive thing. The fact that I, working up the hill this earlier, uh, last year, I got into the habit of working my t-shirt when we, during the winter as well, and that More helped me. Now. Yeah, I, it makes me feel not less the the cold in the house. I generally probably like the fire when it gets down to 13, 14 degrees. Oh my God, that's cold! That's so yeah. cold. Yeah. A lot more hardy than me. Only four degrees. But now I haven't lit the fire for weeks because it seems so warm. Yeah, we've winter. had a really mild winter this year, yeah. thank goodness. It means yeah. less on our heating bills. Yeah. Have you integrated into the community here? I met you through Romeo, so yeah. I presume you've got loads of friends. Everybody knows you. I don't know about loads of friends, but I, <laughs> I've been around here for a while, so probably more people know me than I know them because I'm you know, uh, a bit different. But it's not a big town, so people see you, recognize you by face, and inevitably you get to know a few people. Yeah, I have some good friends who, you know, we, we appreciate and respect each other. Although, you know, I'm, as I say, I maybe don't fit in the category perfectly. For example, they like to grow wine and do the traditional things and get together and drink a lot. But uh, so you mainly I'm hang out by yourself. In your house? Well, it's because I have my so all these projects, unfinished projects, which keep me keep me busy. And then I'm very good at distractions. So with the distractions as well, I, I never have time to do half the things I'd like to, uh, and like work. How about the <laughs> expat others. community around here? Because we're in the Casa di Romagna, and as you said about the European Space Agency, there are so many expats living on this side of Rome, in the Casa di Romagna. Frascati, Nemi. Do you have any expat friends? Do you not part of that sort of community? You're more, you're more integrated with the Italian side of things rather than the expats. Well, I, I guess probably because of my lifestyle, I don't sort of socialize a great deal. But in terms of Brits, there's one guy called Jim. I don't know if you know him, Jim, who lives near Montepulciano as a family and he had a plot of land actually up the hill which he then sold and that was an interesting project but I haven't been in touch with him for some time now he used to like renovating his own uh, uh, okay, no, classic I don't know bikes, him, yeah. motorbikes okay. and then there's another English guy called Robert who lives the other side of this town and he now has a little son I married an Italian. So I see him a fair bit. I have to feed his cats while he's away. More recently, uh, an English lady called Frederica has uh, arrived and she's bought an apartment in the center of town. Okay. So beyond that, 
and yeah. no many other English people. So how big is your flat? Yeah, 70, 80 square meters. But I have the rooftop terrace, ter flat terrace roof. The, the people who previously owned this house, they said when they grew up, basically all this land was all green. There weren't any houses between here and Monteporzio, this town in front. And now, as you can see, there's like houses littered everywhere. Yeah, I think what I've been doing is, seems to be, um, you have all these programs in the UK for renovating your own house. So it's much more of a popular thing in our British culture than it is in Italy. Yeah, Italians don't do it yourself very much, no, do they? They're always so. getting a contractor. And yet, um, I'm not too sure how it works, but I think when you do renovations, you have to present to the council, you know, your, your documents yeah. and everything. Yeah. And I don't even know if you have the possibility of mentioning on there that you're doing it yourself. Well, they call it in economia. Yeah. Okay. Which so means you get the permission and then you do it in your own way. Okay, that's good to know. That's helpful. So, personal question. How do you keep yourself? Do you do odd jobs? How do you keep yourself? Uh, well, lately, you know, how do I maintain myself yeah. financially? With, with yeah. difficulty, actually. It's a bit of a, a bit of a stress. But I have been getting some social benefit from uh, what they call reddito, which is an answer, because I am, you know, and I've applied for citizenship since a few years, you know, five years oh, ago. Oh, you've applied for citizenship? I applied. It does, does take time, these things. No. I'm effectively qualified as a citizen. But, you know, it's, 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 um, it's hard, isn't it's it? Meager. Yeah, it's, 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 it's meager. Yeah, it's, uh, unless you're fortunate to have a job where you're posted to Italy from abroad or you start off with a big nest egg. It can be a hard place, can't it? Well, I have some friends, so that, that you know, it helps to have some friends with you. Know, mix. Yeah. And one thing I always say to, well, not always, thankfully, but sometimes I say to people, it's easier to be poor in a warm country than it is Absolutely. in in cold Absolutely. and bleak, blighty, I suppose. Absolutely. And that's part of the reason the Italian way of life is appealing, isn't it? Because the food is simple. You only need a loaf of bread, some olive oil, tomatoes, and that is an amazing meal, really. Mm. You don't need a lot because you have the availability of good vegetables, good fruit. You can live off less in that sense. If you mm. avoid all the excess and you don't go and buy your prosciutto every day, then you can. Yeah. Well, I, I, as, I, as I say, I have settled down onto my routine of shopping, for example. I, I go to the cheaper supermarkets and I buy as little as I can from the supermarket, uh, just the things which are cost effective and I prefer to eat bio as much as possible, as much as, as, as it can. could be. Yeah. But a lot of the time it's very expensive and uncertain, yeah. uncertain worthiness. So generally I, I, I personally use a lot of grains, a lot of nuts and fruits and just the original things and I make my Are own Are you food. vegetarian, vegan? No, no. no. But I, I don't buy a lot of meat. Generally. So the, the foods which are generally more expensive, I um, buy limited amounts yeah. occasionally. But the, the, the one thing that, yeah, I'm attentive to the prices. I noticed, for example, if you go to a, a supermarket and you buy pizza, you know, you pay a horrendous amount for, you know, the cost of kilo of pizza is the same as cost of Parmesan. And Parmesan is expensive, but at least nutritionally, it's, it's very rich. It's, it's great. So you consider yourself healthy. Do you think you're in general good health? Yeah, uh, pretty well. I do do... And what do you think of the health system here? Have you had any reason I to try to avoid it as much as possible? possible. The same as anywhere. I think who was it who said that you know food should be your medicine and medicine your food. Yeah. So I think if you do nourish yourself well and avoid things which are you know bad for your health, then you can rely on natural healing mechanisms to keep yourself well enough. That's all really interesting. We could spend a whole day just talking about that. Yeah. Do you 
have an actual budget and you you stick to your budget or do you just you know oh, like today i can only spend that or i've only got this this month and do you divide it up or do you just live day by day uh, um yes day by day <laughs> i mean a uh, budget is i make do with what, what i have and it's it, often times it's a mystery how i manage uh, mm. i don't look too far in the future because it there's not much i can do about that but somehow i'm get by mm. it's more that I don't like throwing away stuff that I'm gonna might need especially when you have to pay money to get to, to get it again, and especially now I don't have a much money. Italy's not a bad place actually if you appreciate the geography, the the nature and the land, the climate. It's not a bad place. I think it is has a history of, you could say, contadino history of uh, agricultural. Produce. Which is why people are so healthy as well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, there's this yeah. high percentage of centenarians. Yeah. And it's under onslaught. You know, there is a, is being challenged by the forces of commerce that want to basically uh, undermine what's natural and traditional. Do you think you're going to stay in Italy? Can you see you spending the rest of your life here? Mm. It's... Uh, long time but i can't see myself being anywhere else for the time being unless some other opportunity shows up i'm a, i'm actually quite invested invested in in the land in the natural lifestyle in doing things autonomously <laughs>